Hello everybody, Ben Rogers here, the Raptors Digest, reacting to the Toronto Raptors 129-102 win against the Chicago Bulls. Riker, 11 game win streak right now, the Raptors continue to roll, and the Chicago Bulls, they started off this game the first half, they were playing good defense, they were swinging the ball on offense, but once that second half came around, the Raptors came out and just finished finished the Chicago Bulls. Ben, one more, one more game, is it, until the Raptors have set franchise history is that mm -hmm. isn't it crazy yep. too given that this is the team that has the the potential to do that i mean it's not a crazy hard stretch of basketball but this is a Kawhi leonard less toronto raptors team and they're about to be the most winningest in a stretch of that it's pretty incredible but anyways man we're talking about this game right now and wow i mean Everybody got their points up. Almost everybody got into double digits, but we're going to have to start with the man of this game, Terrence Davis. Career high, 31 points. What did you see from him tonight? Terrence Davis was out here. The threes that he was hitting, he came into the game, and Matt and Jack were on the broadcast talking about how with Norman Powell out with that hand injury, the, there's players are going to have to step up. We've seen Patrick McCall. He, last game, he didn't take a shot. Terrence Davis, his minutes have been reduced over the past couple games. And obviously, Matt Thomas only has really played this season when players are when we're really depleted. So there was a calling for the backup wings, the backup shooting guards, to really fill that giant hole that Norman Powell leaves when he's not on the court because he's been amazing for us this season. And all three of those guys played really well, but obviously you mentioned it. The guy that... that really stepped up was Terrence Davis against his uh, uh, Thaddeus Young on the Chicago Bulls. He played on Thaddeus Young's AAU team for many of years, so it was a really cool game for him to have this career high, but he came into the game right away, was splashing threes, hit two back-to-back -back threes, was aggressive the whole night, but didn't force his game, and that's, th that's the thing about Terrence Davis. For an undrafted rookie, for a, just a rookie in general, Usually these guys come in, and especially when they're getting inconsistent minutes, even though TD's been pretty well in the rotation the whole year, but still not a lot of minutes each game, they usually come in and force it a little bit. They, they're tended to, or they're passive one possession. They're like, oh, okay, I haven't shot in five possessions. They're being aggressive. TD doesn't do that. He lets the game come to him, and his efficiency tonight record, 12 of 15 from the field, 6 of 7 from the three-point line, but all those shots were good, and... He's got that stroke, man. He's got that killer instinct. To, if he's on a roll, he's going to keep pushing on the gas. He is a confident player, Ben. There's one thing to talk about, tentativeness, and he's a guy that's never afraid to pull mm -hmm. trigger. That's been the same. That's the reason that he's earned minutes as an undrafted rookie on a defending championship Toronto Raptors team. It is extremely difficult to do that, but you have to attribute it. One, yeah, he's a skilled player, but you could argue that everybody who makes the NBA, they have to be skilled. Yep. It's attitude. And I think that that's a big reason for his success so far. Ben, I think it's a good thing that Leo wasn't on tonight's broadcast because he was fuming the other evening about the Terrence Davis being snubbed from the Rising Stars game. And if you break yep. down the player efficiency ratings per um, 30 minutes, because obviously other people in his pool, they're on lesser teams, so they're going to have more opportunity to play. But what Terrence Davis is able to do in his limited minutes is nothing shy of incredible, especially considering he's playing on a team on a defending championship team, and everybody deserves to to score, and everybody can score. So it's it's pretty phenomenal that he's out there balling, and uh, it's pretty it's nice to see him have such a good game. Yeah, silencing the doubters, and he's highest for all rookies in terms of plus minus. I think they mentioned he was twenty first in the whole entire NBA. So obviously, plus minus game to game is is very has some wide variances. It's not a it's truly precise stat, but as you look over a larger sample size, it's pretty indicative of a solid performance over the course of a year. So TD has just been wicked, and tonight it was a, it was a culmination of everything that he's done so far. And with Norman Powell out for an indefinite period of time, hopefully he'll be able to keep it up. But before we get to the starters, and a few of the guys had solid games tonight, but Patrick McCaw, he's a guy that people have been harping on for a while, and obviously we've been critical of him when he has poor games, but we've... Both you and I believe the hate has gone t too much for Patrick McCaw. He still is a solid defender, and you brought why TD gets a lot of minutes. The The main reason you get on the floor for the Toronto Raptors is if you're a solid defender. If you can play defense, Nick Nurse will let you play through some offensive struggles. So, you know, that that's a big reason TD's on the court. And Patrick McCaw has just been adored by Nick Nurse. And last game, he, he didn't take a shot. People were very critical of that. And... 
tonight, even though he only took five, and he had 10 points, two assists, two rebounds, not a flat-out eye-popping box score, but he did look a lot more aggressive. He was making nice passes, and we're going to leave a play for the, the segments that he had. But when Patrick McCaw is aggressive, man, he, he opens everything up for everyone else because he's such a good passer for a wing guy, and you play him with Fred Van Vliet, Kyle Lowry, TD, you have players that can pass, dribble, and shoot all on the court that can create plays for people. It's aggressive Patrick McCall is such an asset for the Toronto Raptors they, team. I just wish he came be. in with this mindset all games. They have to be, Ben, because if you put on your coaching hat, right, you're wearing mm-hmm. your coaching shoes for a second. I'm sure we've had coaches say to us, or if anybody listening to this has ever been either a player or a coach, you know, you can be a defender, you can be a rebounder, but at a certain point, right, if you're not willing to at least size up, right, at least mm-hmm. make the defense fret that you are going to shoot every now and then, you're you're basically allowing them to have, a, a, an all, for all intents and purposes, a, a five on four, right, because they yeah. don't need to have one man. They can sag off so much because they're, you're basically saying you're not a threat. So I totally agree. I'd almost like to see OG Ananobi be more aggressive uh, nightly, and we'll talk about him in this podcast as well. Just even if you're not making the shots, just have a few per game because Patrick McCoy does everything else, right? And that's the reason yep. Nick Nurse is high on him. I'm high on him. Uh, so if he's able to just make one or two threes a game, if he can be in that six to ten point range, I think that that's really all that you need because he's he's gonna play you know reduce minutes and play good defense. So I, I like what I saw as well. But Ben, who who else stood out for you tonight or stood out for you? Well, you brought up OJ and Nobi. He started off the game really struggled the the Chicago Bulls defense really locked in on OG tonight they it looked like he was a focal point in terms of who they were trying to guard so that was that was interesting to see because every time OG got the ball it looked like they were they didn't throw a double but they were throwing a lot of help side defense so he struggled to do those overpowering post finishes he looked pretty aggressive more aggressive than usual at the start but then he just ran into some walls but the thing about same in the same vein of Patrick McCaw even when he's struggling on offense OG still provides all the defense he he was rebounding the ball at a tremendous level tonight he was getting deflections on the defensive end and what was a big reason the Raptors be able to, were able to turn around their defense in the second half and then you know the, the a, a huge asset probably OG's best offensive asset right now is he has a high basketball IQ I know he turns over the ball a little bit more than you'd like for a wing defender but or wing uh, offensive player but he can cut well he just knows where to be he knows how to make that extra pass and he got a couple of really nice dunks tonight off uh, some great cuts but you mentioned it him being able to even with added help and added pressure from the Bulls, you'd like for OJG to be able to score on a few more guys, but that's not really his role right now, and we don't really need... We have a lot of guys who could put the ball in the hole, so I think OG will catch some flack, and that's why I want to shine some positives on this game tonight, But because you look at his box score, and he did have a couple of poor turnovers, but solid game. But the, the rest of the starters... It was a very level scoring night tonight. Siakam had 17, Ibaka with 16, Lowry with 14, Fred with 12, and they all played really solid games tonight. Uh, Ibaka, as of late, that's a, that's a player we haven't really talked about a lot, and he had 16 points, 6 rebounds, 3 blocks. He stepped up with Marc Gasol out with injury. He's had a very strong defensive performance in all of his last few games, and he, he's looking confident as ever, Riker. Yeah, absolutely, Ben. And we spoke about it last podcast. He is looking more confident with his threes. We're not we're not stressed when you mm-hmm. see him take a shot from outside the perimeter. But we mentioned this last season. We probably mentioned it every season. Mm-hmm. Um, it, he, he looks better, or his game seems to flow more naturally when he starts on the inside. And it's yep. a classic inside-out type basketball. Tonight, you know, he's making his post hook. It is a classic Serge Ibaka move uh, when either he gets that offensive rebound and he just really quickly turns it around and floats it back up. Mm-hmm. Or uh, he loves his back down post finishes. And had a few few, few dunks tonight as well, Ben. He was just playing aggressive all around. And in a game against Chicago, you can kind of be imposing yourself in the yep. interior. Um, and But in any matchup, Serge Ibaka is pretty physically dominant, right? There's not a lot of people, I think, that can body um, Serge Ibaka, especially if he's coming off the bench or if he's playing in that bench rotation. There's not a lot of bench centers that um, I, I think are, are much larger than him. So yep. he definitely has the ability to play strong. It's just his confidence and his aggressiveness. And tonight that he had those two things. Yeah, most definitely. And 
Yeah, you bring up the the bench centers. When Serge Ibaka has a, a rookie or less less veteran player up against him, he really knows how to use his footwork and all that. And obviously, the Bulls are pretty depleted right now as well. So they had guys like Luke Cornett and Felicio on him for most of this game, and Serge was just having a field day in the paint. So shouts to Serge Ibaka for just the just the consistency he's had this year, playing the best season of his career. So shout out Serge and our backcourt tonight. Kyle Lowry came out the gates splashing threes. Fred Van Vliet did looked like he was struggling a little bit in in this game, even though his efficiency is a lot better than looking at the box score now. It was five eleven from the field, had twelve points, but. The way they controlled the pace of this game, it was just great to see. And Fred Van Vliet, uh, I'm going to save the two highlight plays I know everyone's thinking of for for the segments, but his handle, Riker, I know he's always been tight. He doesn't turn over the ball a lot for a guy with the ball in his hands as much as he does, But and he's always been a, a decent at getting around people. But this season, the way he's dribbling, his double crosses, the, the people are up on him. People know who Fred Van Vliet is now. And he's just so confident with driving through the lanes and having that tight handle, making those passes. It, it's such an asset to have. Yeah, absolutely, Ben. And it, do you know what impresses me more, though, personally, than the ability to have a crossover to make somebody dance? Because if they're a step back on you, you have enough space to make those dribble moves, right? Mm-hmm. But he's been, I think, pretty aggressive this season. And the protection dribble is what I think is most impressive. Yeah. When you, you get yourself into the lane... Mm-hmm. Right. And then they help comes and you almost have a double on you to hold, to be able to maintain your dribble and either bring it back out or finish the drive. Right. When you have to bring the ball low, just keep it away from the opposing players. I've I've been keying into that as of late, funny enough, and seeing Fred. And I, I've just been extremely impressed. And then you add on he's <laughs> ankle breakers, crossovers, everything, uh, you know, no spoilers yet. We're just about to swing to the segments. But, um, yeah, he's his his handle is tight. That's a that's a good way to describe it. No, definitely. And well, last last couple players we got to talk about. Chris Boucher off the bench, 15 points, 5 rebounds. We've been raving about Boucher ever since he's got those minutes back. And once again, comes into the game really confident. In the first half, the Raptors looked like they were struggling a little bit and almost dug a little hole for themselves. But then TD, as we've talked, we've raved about in this podcast, but Boucher also really sparked that run for the Raptors in the second quarter. We know Boucher's never going to pass up a shot. He started off the game with a with a nice dunk over Felicio, a quick dribble by, and then he's letting those... It was a long two that was the possession after, but once he starts hitting those shots, you know he's going to keep going for it, and you love to see it for a player coming off the bench just to provide that energy, provide that spark, and, you know, in the same vein of Lou Williams would. Just when you see bench guys like TD and Boucher start knocking down shots, and then you can bring back in guys like Siakam, Van Vliet, Lowry to pair along with that sort of momentum. It's a real killer for other teams, and Boucher, man, he he just continues to exceed expectations, and he does it on the defensive end as well. He gets blocks. The block Quebecois is really out here, Riker. (laughs) Yeah. With that response, Chris we're going to swing it to the, the next Lou Williams. With the next Lou Williams. Um, without further ado, Ben, let's swing it to the segment. <laughs> Most definitely. And tonight, the spicy P lay of the day. We have we have a lot from this game, and we just alluded to it with Fred Van Vliet. Tonight had two ridiculous ankle breakers. One, the defender ended up falling. Fred ended up hitting the jump shot. That's been all over Raptors Twitter and Reddit. That's that's a big one. But the the one that might get overlooked because of that early ankle breaker was Fred's. It was like a hesitation slow cross. Then he fed right into a double cross, blew right past Kobe White. The help defense came out, and then he threw a one-handed skip pass to uh, Patrick McCaw, who splashed the corner three. Fred Van Vliet had a couple of really nice just handles and ankle breakers tonight paired along with just what he's been doing all this season with this tight handle and also Patrick McCaw people were calling for him to be more aggressive and he came out in this game one of his first possessions with the ball was on the fast break and this is the thing people forget about Patrick McCaw he is a guard he is a is a primary ball handler he has a tight handle when he's confident when he wants to use it wants to bring it out he's got to bring it out more often but at full speed Riker Full speed, does an inside-out cross at a, in a full sprint, finishes right at the rim, had the defense just frozen in their feet. It's it's great to see Patrick McCaw having one of these aggressive games, and hopefully he can keep it up now over the, the course of the season. 
Those are hard to do, Ben. I, mm-hmm. You're a better ball handler than me. I still try to pull the moves out in my intramurals, <laughs> but I, you know, when you are on the fast break to do a, a dribble move or even a double dribble move, it's challenging, especially if you're not trying to slow down, right? If you yep. can slow down, then speed back up. But to do it at pace is really hard. But anyways, great. Some really great crossovers, like you said, uh, this evening. But not all plays can be the spicy p lay of the day. Some make you say, oh, geez. Ben, what do you have for OG's play tonight? And tonight, Pascal Siakam, he was, he, there were stretches. This game. I know he didn't have the greatest field night. It was 6 of 14 from the field, 17 points, 9 rebounds, 5 assists. So just a, a solid game for Siakam. But he had a couple post fades tonight, and it gave me flashbacks of, of the people, what people call the Lebronto moment, when LeBron was just hitting all those post fades. And Thaddeus Young, I got to give him a lot of credit tonight. I think he's going to be a player that, some some contending teams are going to look to trade for because he's been playing pretty solid, pretty, going overlooked as he's playing for the Chicago Bulls, who have a poor record. But Pascal Siakam, over some really tight defense, hit some post fadeaways that were just uh, really exciting to see Siakam hit. And Jack went, was talking about it on the broadcast. In the playoffs, we're going to need Siakam to hit tough shots like that. And it didn't look like he had his usual touch around the rim. And there's a lot of contact that he was getting in the middle of this game. And a lot of stuff wasn't getting cold. But Siakam being able to knock down those post fadeaways is going to be so essential for us to beat these top tier teams in the playoffs. It's a good point because pace really slows down in playoff matchups. The mm-hmm. defense tightens up, interior defense, and you know your your concentration on the key player so Siakam is not gonna you're absolutely right and especially given who we're probably gonna face come playoff time whether it's um the Celtic or not really the Celtics so much the 76ers mm-hmm. the Bucks I mean even, even the Heat right with yeah. them big guys right yeah. so he does need to be able to hit those shots I absolutely 100% agree and um yeah final final segment the one the only DeMarie Carroll gold star award for worst performance or it's sort of adapted Ben hasn't it it just it doesn't mean anything it's just whatever (laughs) we're feeling so uh, I don't know if you have a gold star it could go to Zach Levine saying that there's no 12 players better than him in the east and we broke it down we determined that there is 12 players better than him in the east I'll leave it up to the comment people to think to figure out who those players are we we can break it down in some other video if we want but Ben do you have a different gold star I, I do, Riker, and we had a lengthy conversation before this podcast, but uh, we, we d- officially determined that there are 12 players better than Zach Levine in the East that have played this year, so not including, like, KD or Oladipo, even though Oladipo's back at this point. But Jim Boylan, the coach of the Chicago Bulls, he's been flamed this season for how he's just managed players' personalities on the Chicago Bulls. Zach Levine has been open about his displeasure with Jim Boyland and there's there's a lot of stuff that's coming out about the Bulls and he at the end of this game the Raptors are up 30 it's Super Bowl weekend and I know Matt and Jack were kind of hooting and hollering about the Super Bowl a lot and it's going to be exciting to watch and all that but you're all, you're down by like 30 close to the, the Raptors end up winning by 27 so it was a, it was a massive margin and with one minute left you know, we have all the, the deep bench guys. We have, uh, you know, O'Shea Brissett in there, Paul Watson. We have, we have at both teams have their deep bench in. He decides to call a timeout. He decides to call t- and he's and he, the, the camera panned in on him, and he's drawing up stuff on the whiteboard, and it, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense. The next possession, too, they ended up turning it over, and then there ended up being a lob from uh, Watson to, to uh, O'Shea Brissett. But, Riker, what are you, what are you doing down 30? Calling a timeout with know, one man left. Listen, you save it for your team practices or yeah. something because it's no more valuable to do it in game and scrub minutes than it is to do it. I totally agree. It's especially whatever. on a on a he, day like he, today. <laughs> True. No, but that that's how it be. Raptors got the W. Continue their massive win streak. And yeah, we'll let you're the best for making this far. Check out the Twitter, the Instagram, all that cool stuff. Let us know in the comment section below what your thoughts are on this game about all the Raptors news going around. So, Riker, you have any last words? Um, the Chiefs are winning tonight. That's my pick, Ben. Okay. I'm go. going 49ers. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs>